Ronan Farrow, Catch and Kill, Lies, Spies, and a Conspiracy to Protect Predators. Dive into the gripping world of investigative journalism with Ronan Farrow's Catch and Kill, Lies, Spies, and a Conspiracy to Protect Predators. This book reveals the dangerous search for the truth behind powerful figures in the media industry. Follow Farrow's journey as he uncovers Harvey Weinstein's history of sexual assault and harassment, the inner workings of NBC, and the larger culture of silence that has allowed predators to thrive. This summary takes you through shocking testimonies, the pursuit of leads, and ultimately the unraveling of shocking scandals. The Unveiling of NBC's Bias In 2016, The Washington Post exposed a controversial recording of presidential candidate Donald Trump engaging in a lewd conversation about women. The video was originally filmed for NBC's Access Hollywood, which placed the network in a complicated situation considering it featured both Trump and NBC's recently promoted host, Billy Bush. Instead of addressing the situation head-on, NBC chose to downplay the issue and suppress related stories, showing a reluctance to cover sexual assault-related news. The release of a shocking recording by The Washington Post in October 2016 threatened to derail Donald Trump's presidential campaign. In the video, which was filmed for the celebrity gossip show Access Hollywood in 2005, Trump was heard making crude remarks about grabbing women. As papers and TV stations across the country scrambled to report this potential game-changer, NBC, the network behind Access Hollywood, seemed hesitant to join the controversy. The leaked video placed NBC in a difficult position, as it not only featured Trump's vulgar comments but also included the show's host, Billy Bush, cheerfully agreeing with the presidential candidate. Having recently promoted Bush, NBC chose to omit his most offensive comments when airing the video. This, however, was the least of their troubles. Questions arose about how long NBC had been aware of the tape and why they had not aired it sooner. Although senior executives attributed the delay to an ongoing legal review, it was later revealed that NBC Universal lawyers had already approved its release. While this issue unfolded, another story was brewing within the network. Investigative journalist Ronan Farrow, Frustrated by NBC's decision to block his report on college sexual assault investigations, discovered that the network planned to air Bush's apology in place of his segment. Left with the choice of confronting this contradiction or attempting to sweep it under the rug, NBC chose to quietly address the situation by suspending Bush and featuring a report on Adderall abuse instead. Suspicious of the network's intentions, Farrow texted his producer, Rich McHugh, asking if NBC was afraid of broadcasting sexual assault stories. McHugh's unequivocal response, yes. In this instance, NBC's actions illustrated their reluctance to take a firm stance on sexual assault and revealed the inherent biases within the organization. Uncovering Hollywood's Dark Side the high-profile cases of powerful men displaying predatory sexual behavior had unsettled the entertainment industry. Among these was Bill Cosby's sexual assault allegations in 2014, and in July 2016, Gretchen Carlson's suit against Fox News head, Roger Ailes. As masses of women across the United States marched in 2017 in response to Donald Trump's presidency, Actress Rose McGowan made headlines as she explained why hashtag women don't report, citing her own experience after reporting her rape by a studio head. Her career suffered while her rapist faced no consequences. Journalist Ronan Farrow was pursuing an investigative series titled The Dark Side of Hollywood when he encountered McGowan's story, setting off an investigation that would shake Hollywood and expose far-reaching abuse within the industry. The Access Hollywood tape was just one high-profile instance of powerful men displaying predatory sexual behavior. After Bill Cosby's sexual assault allegations in 2014 and Gretchen Carlson's sexual harassment suit against Roger Ailes in 2016, millions of women marched and held sit-ins across the United States in 2017. Amid these protests, Actress Rose McGowan responded to journalist Liz Plank's question on social media about why hashtag women don't report. Sharing her own story, 
McGowan revealed that when she first reported being raped by a studio head, a female lawyer told her no one would take her seriously due to a sex scene in one of her films. The lawyer's prediction came true, as the allegations went ignored, and McGowan's career took a nosedive. Investigative journalist Ronan Farrow was working on a new series titled The Dark Side of Hollywood at the time. His boss, NBC executive Noah Oppenheim, approved the project, but disagreed with Farrow's proposed focus on sexual misconduct involving minors. Ultimately, they decided to examine Hollywood's infamous casting couch and the exchange of sexual favors for roles. Seeking a solid lead, Oppenheim suggested Farrow contact McGowan about her experience with the studio head. By reaching out to McGowan, Farrow embarked on an investigation whose effects would reverberate far beyond the entertainment industry and bring numerous abusers to light. Breaking Weinstein's Damning Silence Rose McGowan's accusation of Harvey Weinstein's rape opens up a long trail of rumors surrounding the infamous movie mogul. With a history of success in the film industry, a love for cinema, and an explosive temper, Weinstein maintained an untouchable reputation through his power, influence, and capacity to silence his victims. However, as whispers of sexual harassment and assault become louder, it's time to shatter the silence and reveal the truth hidden beneath the Hollywood facade. A man whose name echoed throughout the entertainment world, Harvey Weinstein's power knew no bounds. Having formed Miramax and the Weinstein Company, his achievements include producing influential movies like Pulp Fiction, The English Patient, and The King's Speech, contributing to 300 Oscar nominations in the process. He was often thanked as much as, if not more than, God in Hollywood circles. Weinstein's love for cinema began in his teenage years, sparked by a chance encounter with the French film masterpiece, The 400 Blows. Together with his brother Bob, they both embarked on a lifelong journey to redefine the movie industry. Notwithstanding his achievements and passion, a stark contrast lurked beneath the surface. Weinstein's six-foot frame and lopsided face left countless people trembling in fear, as his notorious rages involved verbal abuse, cursing, and the hurling of objects around his office. For over two decades, whispers regarding sexual harassment and assault trailed the 65-year-old studio executive. Numerous attempts to expose his misconduct never seemed to make it into the press or on air. Weinstein held powerful strategies to keep the sordid truth hidden, using non-disclosure agreements, payoffs, legal threats, and under-the-table career sabotage to silence his victims. The time, however, has come for change. With the emergence of Rose McGowan's accusation, the floodgates are open and the growing whispers will soon become an unstoppable roar. As the darkness enveloping Weinstein's life rises to the surface, the once untouchable mogul is finally exposed for the world to see. It's time for justice. The Fall of Silence in Hollywood In early 2016, Ronan Farrow's op-ed highlighted the consistent ignorance of credible sexual abuse allegations in Hollywood, giving voice to the silenced victims. This courage eventually led him to Rose McGowan, who openly shared her heartbreaking experience with Harvey Weinstein. Despite obtaining this crucial testimony, Farrow still needed something more concrete to bring light to the shadows festering in the film industry. When prompted by The Hollywood Reporter to investigate the merits of criticisms aimed at their controversial piece veiling accusations against his father Woody Allen, Ronan Farrow delved into his sister Dylan's experience. In his praised op-ed, Farrow unveiled the shameful silence cloaking believable cases of sexual abuse within the entertainment world's glitz and glamour. This dangerous hush, he stated, condemns victims to further suffering by making the pain of speaking out seem unbearable. About a year later, Farrow contacted Rose McGowan, an actress who, despite feeling let down by the media, recalled the authenticity of the previously published piece. It became a bridge of trust, leading to a recorded interview in February 2017. In this conversation, McGowan narrated her harrowing incident with Harvey Weinstein during the 1997 Sundance Film Festival. Initially, they met in a hotel suite, discussing her performances in Scream and Phantoms. But as she prepared to leave, the encounter turned horrific. 
Tearfully, McGowan confirmed to Pharaoh that she had been raped by Weinstein. Under the guidance of her attorney, McGowan reluctantly agreed to a financial settlement and signed away her right to sue. Several individuals, including assistants, managers, and brokers, contributed to keeping the matter under wraps. Ben Affleck, her co-star in Phantoms, was angered at Weinstein's actions, making it evident that his misconduct was hardly a secret. Repeating her story on camera, McGowan omitted Weinstein's name, urging viewers to draw their own conclusions. When asked if he had perpetrated the crime, she hesitated before admitting her difficulty in even uttering such a loathsome name. Pharaoh's interview with McGowan marked a crucial point in exposing the silence that had long protected the guilty in Hollywood. And yet, this testimony alone was insufficient, a more tangible form of evidence was needed to bring the full weight of truth crashing down upon the corrupted film industry. Silencing Amber Gutierrez in March 2015, Filipina-Italian model Amber Gutierrez left Harvey Weinstein's office in tears and reported to the police that she'd been groped by him. After acquiring undeniable evidence through a police sting, the case seemed to be going in Gutierrez's favor. However, Weinstein, with alleged help from National Enquirer's CEO David Pecker and Editor-in-Chief Dylan Howard, flipped the narrative and discredited Gutierrez, ultimately leading to the charges being dropped. Left with no other choice, Gutierrez signed an NDA for a $1 million payout, believing that all evidence was destroyed. Unknown to Weinstein, a private copy remained. Amber Gutierrez, the Filipina-Italian model who accused Harvey Weinstein of sexual misconduct, left Weinstein's New York office in 2015 in tears, reporting his assault on her to the police. In a recorded sting operation orchestrated by the Special Victims Division, Gutierrez extracted a confession from him as he stated, I'm sorry, just come on in, I'm used to it, when he tried to persuade her into his hotel room. This provided clear evidence of third-degree sexual abuse, punishable by up to three months in jail. However, despite the strong evidence, Gutierrez's path to justice was obstructed. March and April of 2015 saw the constant presence of David Pecker and Dylan Howard, CEO and editor-in-chief of the tabloid newspaper National Enquirer, in Weinstein's offices. Together, they allegedly strategized to divert media attention from Weinstein's accusations and shift the blame back to Gutierrez, thereby making the Amber thing fade away. The Enquirer successfully flipped the narrative. Harvey Weinstein vanished from headlines, replaced by derogatory articles about Gutierrez. Insinuations that she was a prostitute surfaced following revelations of her attendance at one of Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi's Bunga Bunga parties. The media even painted her as a predator seeking to extort Weinstein. When the district attorney's office finally received the case, they directed their focus on Gutierrez's connections to Berlusconi rather than on Weinstein's offense. Ultimately, citing insufficient evidence, the charges were dropped in April. However, as an NYPD internal review revealed later, other cases had resulted in arrests with less evidence in comparison. Having no legal recourse and her reputation in shambles, Gutierrez had no choice but to sign an 18-page nondisclosure agreement. NDA, in exchange for a $1 million payout. Weinstein assumed the matter was resolved and all evidence destroyed, as stated in the NDA. What he didn't know was that a private copy of the recording still existed, a testament to Gutierrez's fight for justice against all odds. The Uncovered Audio Tape When Gutierrez came forward about her experience with Weinstein and revealed that she had not destroyed an incriminating audio tape as per their nondisclosure agreement, Farrow faced a difficult decision. He needed to acquire the file without implicating Gutierrez or NBC in breaching legal terms. Through a careful maneuver, he managed to obtain a copy of the tape by recording it on his phone. However, Weinstein's vast connections were already aware of his investigation, and Farrow soon found himself under the looming intimidation of powerful influences. Gutierrez had a shocking revelation for Farrow. Despite a non-disclosure agreement, she had managed to retain an incriminating recording created during a police sting on Weinstein. Farrow listened to the recording, 
which unmistakably portrayed Weinstein's predatory behavior, and realized the undeniable significance in obtaining this evidence. The dilemma was clear, Gutierrez providing the tape would endanger her with legal repercussions, while NBC could face charges of tortious interference if Farrow used it in his reporting. Ingeniously, Farrow devised a plan to maintain plausible deniability by recording Gutierrez's playback of the original file, without exchanging files or leaving any digital trace behind. However, Farrow hadn't counted on just how far-reaching Weinstein's connections were. As is consistent in the world of journalism, when reporters began to investigate someone as influential as Weinstein, their intentions were swiftly discovered. True to form, Farrow soon received a call from Matthew Hiltzik, a well-known PR mastermind with connections to high-profile figures, including the Clinton and Trump families. Hiltzik informed Farrow that Weinstein was aware of his inquiries into the Rose McGowan situation but wanted to assure him there had been no wrongdoing. If Farrow had any questions or concerns, Weinstein was open to address them. Moreover, Hiltzik pointed out that Farrow was writing a book on U.S. foreign policy and required an interview with Hillary Clinton. Hiltzik could facilitate this if necessary. Perhaps, he suggested, Farrow should reconsider the importance of pursuing the Weinstein story. Although the question was left open-ended, Farrow knew that the implications were clear. He had been warned. Despite the pressure, Farrow's unwavering dedication in uncovering the truth and holding the powerful accountable was far too strong to be deterred. Weinstein Scandal's Turning Point In 2016, reporter Ben Wallace investigated Harvey Weinstein for three months, only for New York Magazine to drop the story after threats from Weinstein's associates. Wallace was later approached by reporter Ronan Farrow, and their collaboration led to the breakthrough in exposing Weinstein's predatory behavior. They gathered testimonies, including one from Emily Nestor, a former employee of the Weinstein Company who experienced first-hand harassment. With enough evidence revealing a consistent predatory pattern, the time for publication had come. After diving deep into the rumors surrounding Harvey Weinstein in 2016, Reporter Ben Wallace hit a roadblock when associates of the movie mogul began threatening to leak damaging information about him and his sources. Despite this setback, however, Wallace pressed on, ultimately joining forces with fellow journalist Ronan Farrow in the pursuit of truth. In May 2017, Emily Nestor, a former employee of the Weinstein Company, TWC, became a key witness against Weinstein. With dreams of a career in film, Nestor landed a job at TWC, only to find herself quickly targeted by Weinstein. From her first day on the job, colleagues warned her that she was Weinstein's type. She soon found herself receiving unwanted attention from Weinstein, who invited her for drinks on the very first day. Nestor declined, but agreed to have coffee with him the following morning. The meeting took a harrowing turn when it was unexpectedly moved to a hotel, where Weinstein unabashedly boasted about his sexual conquests and promised to further Nestor's career. Despite rejecting Weinstein's advances multiple times, he seemed unfazed. As Nestor recalled, no did not mean no to him. After her complaints to human resources led nowhere, Nestor received an apology from Erwin Ryder, the company's executive vice president of accounting, who offered support and shared his own experience of confronting Weinstein about his mistreatment of women. However, it went unnoticed, with Weinstein dismissing him as the sex police. Nestor kept the entire exchange on record. Nestor's brave testimony, paired with the explosive interviews of Rose McGowan and the recording of Amber Gutierrez, laid bare the depth of Weinstein's predatory pattern. This mounting evidence equipped Wallace and Farrow with the arsenal they needed to expose the ugly truth behind Hollywood's glitz and glamour. The moment to bring Weinstein's reign of terror to light had finally arrived. Unmasking Weinstein's Deeds In June 2017, Ronan Farrow, along with producer Rich McHugh, prepared a powerful script exposing Harvey Weinstein. The compelling evidence included Gutierrez's tape, McGowan's interview, writer correspondence, and more. However, Noah Oppenheim and NBC Universal undermined Farrow's efforts, causing strife between the investigative team and the network, ultimately leading to crucial lost opportunities. 
By mid-2017, Ronan Farrow and Rich McHugh assembled a script that would bring down notorious producer Harvey Weinstein. Combining impactful evidence such as Gutierrez's recording, an interview with Rose McGowan, the writer correspondence, and another testimony from Nestor, it was difficult to dispute the claims. NBC executive Noah Oppenheim, however, was unconvinced, downplaying the severity of Weinstein's actions and questioning whether they constituted news. Ignoring the fact that Susan Weiner and Richard Greenberg had already approved Farrow's findings, Oppenheim insisted on seeking approval from NBC Universal. Adding fuel to the fire, NBC Universal's general counsel, Kim Harris, who had previously obstructed coverage of Trump's Access Hollywood tape, ultimately caused Farrow's investigation to pause. The only comparable situation was in 1995 when CBS decided against broadcasting an interview with a tobacco industry whistleblower due to concerns over non-disclosure agreements. Farrow and McHugh sensed something unsettling was occurring behind the scenes, as they encountered resistance from their higher-ups and the investigation seemed sabotaged. A prime example was Rose McGowan's follow-up interview. Her naming Weinstein on camera would be crucial, but the pause on reporting forced Farrow to delay the conversation. This only confirmed her doubts about NBC taking the matter seriously enough. Eventually, when the pause lifted on Farrow's reporting, McGowan succumbed to the pressure and cancelled her second interview. The opportunity to get her on record naming Weinstein was tragically lost, largely due to the obstacles thrown in Farrow's way by the very network that should have supported his groundbreaking investigation. Silencing Scandal at NBC When Harvey Weinstein discovered Ronan Farrow's investigation into his sexual misconduct was underway, he reportedly contacted NBC executives, who seemed to downplay the severity of the situation. Despite NBC Universal deeming Farrow's script reportable, Phil Griffin, NBC's head of news coverage, appeared to assure Weinstein that the story would not proceed at the network. Weinstein's communications with NBC began after learning of Farrow's investigation in the spring of 2017. He downplayed the sexual misconduct allegations, justifying it as being a product of the 90s, a time when we all did that. He received assurance from NBC chairman Andrew Lack, who agreed to keep an eye on Farrow and his progress. By early August, Weinstein was informed that NBC Universal considered Farrow's script reportable. Weinstein questioned Phil Griffin about the story's progression, and he reassured the producer that Farrow would not be running the story on NBC. Although Griffin later denied making this promise, at least 15 conversations between Weinstein and senior NBC executives transpired during the spring and summer of 2017. Despite the script's reportable status, Farrow faced obstacles within NBC. When he approached Greenberg, his immediate boss, to request moving to the next stage in the process, seeking comment and editing, Greenberg hesitated. The decision to air the story, he explained, was above his pay grade, leaving Farrow at the mercy of Oppenheim, who raised several weak objections. Oppenheim argued that Farrow's connection to Woody Allen and his sister posed conflicts of interest for the story. Farrow offered full disclosure to viewers regarding his personal connections, but Oppenheim continued to oppose airing the story on TV. He suggested, instead, Farrow move to a print outlet like New York Magazine, even offering his blessing for such a transition. However, he insisted that Farrow cease pursuing sources as an NBC reporter, effectively killing the story at the network. Upon learning the news, Weinstein gleefully celebrated, boasting, I got them to kill this, expletive, story. I'm the only one getting anything done here. Uncovering the Weinstein Scandal On a late summer afternoon in 2017, David Remnick, editor of The New Yorker, and his colleague Deirdre Foley Mendelssohn found themselves revisiting a 2002 profile of Harvey Weinstein. Although the profile didn't delve into the numerous rumors surrounding Weinstein, it mentioned that his business partners often felt raped when dealing with him. Writer Ken Aletta had insufficient evidence to expose Weinstein back then, but Ronan Farrow's contemporary investigation and NBC's refusal to air it had ignited Remnick's interest. Before publishing the scandal, Remnick required an additional source. 
That's when Pharaoh brought English producer Ally Canosa into the picture. Canosa, a Weinstein victim herself, had signed a non-disclosure agreement but was ready to speak out. She shared her encounters with Weinstein on camera in September, revealing her first rape experience in a hotel room while discussing a script. Weinstein lured her into watching a classic movie in his suite and forced himself on her after she repeatedly denied his advances. Canosa continued to work for Weinstein, as she was vulnerable and needed a job. She alleged that he raped her again during the production of the Netflix series Marco Polo in Malaysia. In total, Canosa claimed 11 assaults occurred between 2010 and 2014. Farrow asked Canosa what her message would be to news outlets wrestling with the decision to reveal her allegations. She responded that anyone who failed to unveil Weinstein's crimes would be standing on the wrong side of history. Unraveling Weinstein's Dark Secrets On October 5, 2017, The New York Times published an article revealing the allegations of harassment against film producer Harvey Weinstein. This article, however, was just the beginning, as journalist Ronan Farrow dove deeper into the case, unearthing even more shocking information. Despite Weinstein's attempts to prevent the story from being published, the masks were exposed, revealing the Hollywood predator. While Jody Cantor and Megan Toohey's groundbreaking New York Times article had already shed light on the harassment claims against Harvey Weinstein, Ronan Farrow believed he could reveal even more disturbing details. By adding credible assault allegations to the already growing list, Farrow hoped to unveil the full extent of Weinstein's misdeeds. In a desperate attempt to prevent the New Yorker's expose from reaching the public, Weinstein's lawyers claimed that the magazine would face tremendous damages for breaching numerous nondisclosure agreements. They attacked Farrow's credibility by suggesting that he had been brainwashed into believing his sister's allegations against his father, which fueled his anger and compromised his objectivity. Moreover, they argued that NBC's rejection of Ronan's story and ownership of the material he intended to use should speak volumes about its legitimacy. Undeterred by these baseless claims, Fabio Bertoni, lawyer for The New Yorker, replied with a curt dismissal and continued preparations for publication. The only remaining step was to hear Weinstein's side of the story. In a series of phone conversations that began on October 6, 2017, Weinstein defended himself by claiming that any sexual interactions with women who had continued working for him could not be classified as rape. He also refuted the idea that women who came forward with allegations faced retaliation against their careers. However, his arguments were disingenuous and failed to mention his own involvement in undermining their efforts. Weinstein's attempts to deflect responsibility backfired when he confused different allegations, discussing the details of one woman's story when asked about another. His lawyers abruptly ended the call in order to avoid any further damning revelations. On October 10, 2017, The New Yorker published Farrow's explosive article, which provided evidence supporting the allegations of Rose McGowan, Amber Gutierrez, Emily Nestor, and Zelda Perkins. While Weinstein's dark secrets had been laid bare, Ronan received emails informing him that there were still more predators lurking. One chilling message read, There are more Harveys in your midst. This information only fueled Pharaoh's determination to shed light on the darkest corners of Hollywood and expose those who abused their power. NBC's Glass House While Ronan Farrow was investigating Harvey Weinstein for NBC, the network encountered its own harassment scandal when its star presenter, Matt Lauer, was fired following a complaint from a colleague. Lauer had been known for his inappropriate behavior for years, but NBC denied any knowledge of these issues. However, the network had brokered seven non-disclosure agreements related to Lauer after 2011. During his investigation, Farrow found evidence suggesting that Weinstein was aware of Lauer's behavior and may have leveraged this knowledge to protect himself. NBC's reluctance to expose Weinstein may have stemmed from a fear of exposing its own internal misconduct. Matt Lauer's termination from NBC on November 29, 2017, due to a complaint about his inappropriate advances raised eyebrows across the network. Although the executives professed shock, claiming they knew nothing about his behavior, the employees were far from surprised. 
Lauer had a history of sexual misconduct, including giving sex toys as gifts, playing inappropriate games during commercial breaks, and persistently hitting on female co-workers. Rumors of more egregious acts circulated as well. Producer Rich McHugh suggested that many employees had heard unsettling rumors about Lauer long before his dismissal. When employees demanded to know if the executives were aware of these stories, Kim Harris, NBC's general counsel, evaded the question, stating there were no formal records of any complaints. The truth was that NBC had brokered seven non-disclosure agreements involving Lauer starting in 2011. Among these were serious allegations like coercion and rape, revealing a darker and more troubling pattern of behavior. Yet, when Harris led an internal investigation, the findings absolved the management of any knowledge about the misconduct. During this period, one investigator called attention to a curious connection between Harvey Weinstein's case and Lauer's accusations. He informed Farrow that two sources had said Weinstein was aware of Lauer's misconduct and could make it public. While NBC denied receiving any such threats, it became apparent that Farrow's investigation into Weinstein was risking exposing both Lauer's misdeeds and NBC's cover-up via non-disclosure agreements. Although the degree to which this link influenced executive decisions remains ambiguous, it's reasonable to suspect that the fear of unveiling their own house of glass might have influenced NBC's hesitance to pursue the groundbreaking story on Harvey Weinstein. The axiomatic adage, those who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, seems to have played a pivotal role in NBC's handling of these simultaneous scandals. In conclusion, Catch and Kill exposes Harvey Weinstein's decades-long pattern of abuse and the systematic protection afforded to him and his ilk. Pharaoh's thorough examination of evidence and the obstacles he faced in bringing the story to light highlights a broader culture of silence that enables predators. From the Access Hollywood tape to the dismissal of allegations against Matt Lauer, this book reveals not just individual failures but an entire industry's unwillingness to confront the dark side that exists right under its nose. As more stories come to the surface, Pharaoh's work serves as a rallying cry for courageous voices that refuse to be silenced, and a reminder for the need for transparency and accountability in all walks of life.